All right, so today I'm talking about phylogenetics in the cloud. Um, one thing to note, so your instructors are all volunteering to teach you because they want you to learn. So if I'm speaking too quickly, you don't understand, let me know. If there's, a, if there's jargon I use that you don't understand, let me know. Okay? Please interrupt me. This is intended to help you. Okay? So if it's not helping you, stop, and I'll make it help you. Okay. <coughs> we'll get to this cartoon in a minute. If you've already seen this. Okay. And if you're watching at home, you can go here and get the slides, and you can also get all the links to the resources we're talking about today. So our learning objectives for this section. Okay. So briefly understand what phylogenetics is and its utility for life scientists. Right? We're all life scientists. We study life. Life's related by a tree. We need to get that tree for lots of things. We'll talk about what, why it's cool, why it's interesting. Then I'll talk about some of the computational pitfalls. Okay. So I know what can go wrong, what's hard in this domain, why do we need to use the cloud. Um, talk about some of the available resources. Okay. And then I also want you to become okay with being a user. Right? So I develop code, you develop code, we know how to now run instances on Amazon. Right? So we're like, you know, we're gonna go down, we're gonna be the ones to do this, which is great, right? But at some point you're like, okay, I don't have to build my laptop from scratch, I can just use it. I don't have to build my own cloud, I can use Amazon's. Right? So for a lot of these things, there's already good resources available online that you can use. When you find a hole, you can improve it. Right? Um, but in general, for your cloud, there's lots of cloud resources you can use already. So any questions about any of that? Okay. Sure. Okay. So first of all, phylogenetics is a domain, right? So I spend my life doing this stuff. Like I could be curing cancer, you know, I could be playing baseball or something, but no, I am building and using trees and methods. So why is that? So here's what some of the first stuff I did with trees. All right, so here <coughs> is a bark beetle. Okay. And these make galleries in trees. Okay, the actual like physical tree tree and cut down. Right? Build tunnels. And <coughs> these tunnels become filled with fungus. And the larvae actually eat the fungus. And the question is, you know, is this sort of farming? How has it evolved? What does it lead to? Okay. So I can do a lot of stuff by going out in nature and looking at this stuff. But if I go and add a little bit of sequence data, I can build a tree and find out much more. <coughs> so once I get a tree, I go, here's my phylogeny of these beetles. This is just a tiny sample of diversity. Okay. But even so, I can use this to understand lots of things. So for example, I can plot on what they eat, which, which kind of trees they're in. If you look at all these are eating conifers, um, this one is actually eating from this one's conifer. And you can look at how often that has changed over the tree. This is stuff happening tens of millions of years ago, you know, as you infer from this, this basic data. Okay, I can reconstruct changes on this tree. <coughs> and so agriculture in these beetles occurred seven times. So some of these beetles, the females, have little pockets, and they stuff their pockets with hyphae, they will put some little bits of fungi, fungi and when they find a new, new, new gallery, they get a hole, start growing, and the fungi can start growing. Right? It's like bringing a pack of seeds with you in your covered wagon on Oregon Trail. Right? <coughs> and so this is if it happens seven times, it's seven times origin of farming. Right? It's better, better than humans. Right? We've, we've originated farming you know, five times. Okay. We want diversity. <coughs> so the beetles that feed on intersperms are much more diverse than their sister groups that feed on conifers. Right? So the sister group is, is we have a speciation event, and one group involves conifer feeding, and one group involves intersperm feeding. It's like a twin study. You find many all these cases, you want to reverse feeding on conifers. So it's because you have a faster speciation rate when you write fast, fa more diverse on intersperms. So is it because you have a faster speciation rate when you're in intersperms, a lower extinction rate when you're in intersperms? You can investigate that, but you can get at that information using the tree. <coughs> you can also look at inbreeding. Some of these have the regular looking females, and the males have these weird larval, larval form things that have these giant jaws. And they have a very weird sex ratio. And what it is is the males will impregnate their sisters, and then go to the neighboring gallery, bite off their brother, and try to impregnate them too. There's this weird system, and see, oh, does it correlate with farming? Or at least inbreeding. Right? And start thinking about 
why that strategy might evolve. Okay, so we can get uh, all these questions from just basic natural history and the phylogeny and the right methods. Any questions about that? So because phylogenetics is so cool, which I made a few years ago, here's the number of papers with phylogenetics are shooting off. They're actually phylogenetics. So it's growing through time. You can also see the overlap in fields. So <coughs> at first, phylogenetics starts off as a pimple on the side of evolution. Like this book in the journals. It's becoming much more common across ecology and evolution. It's a big, big growing field. <coughs> what else can you do with it? Well, you can do in special state reconstruction. So here we have a case where this shows how frogs call. <coughs> Even the frog calls. And we can reconstruct that down the tree and then figure out, you know, what did this long ago extinct frog sound like? And then play it back to current frogs. And so Ryan Rand did this <coughs> and found that that frog up there would respond <coughs> to its ancestor, but it doesn't respond to its sister at all. It will respond to this one way down here. So separated by this one from the many, many millions of years, this responds to the call. But the sister species is like, you're not sexy to me, right? <laughs> Which could be some sort of character displacement, right? If you, if you mate with your sister species, maybe you have some weird genetic issues. So you start have being selected against this, this interbreeding. Right? You can figure out how this happens as you, you know, look up things like stink calls using phylogenics. <coughs> figure out molecular evolution, right? So H5N1 bird flu, what made it become a pandemic? So we can look at the reconstruction of it and find out which residues changed. Let's figure out where it came from. Did it come from Hong Kong? Did it come from Taiwan? And we can track this with a tree. <coughs> we can look at things like genome size in dinosaurs. Do we lose birds? So we can do a phylogeny that includes modern organisms, also modern birds, and extinct dinosaurs to figure out if dinosaurs evolved a small genome size before they could fly or after they could fly. Find that many things that fly have tiny genomes. Is it because DNA is heavy? Probably not, <laughs> right? <laughs> we can see with the water books, they break at really fast to develop rate and then fly, or you know, their leg time. <coughs> we can get diversity. So, you know, birds are a very diverse group. Right? So we get wonderful radiation birds. Well, there's only some birds. So here we have a, a tree that looks at rates of evolution of different clades. Find that not all birds are fast, actually, just new avies are fast, one, one subset of birds. Right, so now we're saying, okay, what about them lets them evolve faster? Do they, because you perch on branches, now you can have a, a faster speciation rate? No, 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 so it's going to be investigated. <coughs> These are all things you can do with trees, because no matter what kind of life scientist you, you are, you can use these in some way. How do you get these things? Okay, so here's the overall sort of workflow. So you get sequence data, you build a tree, you calibrate a tree for time, you look at the tree. I met many people who go through the whole workflow and never actually look at their data. So I had a postdoc who worked for a year on a project and never actually looked to see if his data was aligned properly. It's finding these really cool, weird results. Like, yes, it's because it's almost aligned. You look blind it, all went away. Okay? Look at your data, look at your trees. <coughs> now, some people just like the trees, like to know. You know, fungi are more closely related, more related to us than they are to plants. That's cool. That's what you get from the tree. You can also use data, other cool data, to look at things like those bark beetle examples or dinosaur genome size. So talk about how to get those data sets using cloud information. And finally, to try to answer a question. Right? So the goal of this is to do science. So the question about you know, how did bark beetles evolve in breeding? And we use all this stuff just to answer that question. Are there any, any questions about the workflow? In so far. Okay. Is there any questions coming in on Twitter? Let me know too. Hi, Mom. <laughs> <coughs> okay. So, first, getting sequence data. So, what do you do to get sequence data? Yes, exactly. So, you go to GenBank, right? You can also generate yourself in house. And so, GenBank only ha has like 10% of all, all, all described species are in GenBank. So, it's a pretty huge proportion of species. But the one that you care about is not going to be in there. Right? You have to go out to the forest and cut through the jungle and get it and pick up the DNA, you know, pick DNA and 
sequencer. So a lot of it's already in Genbank. Okay. <coughs> and so it's sort of a kind of resource, and there's multiple R packages that let you get Genbank data. Okay. So you want to go through the web browser again. You can get it directly from R. <coughs> and actually, lots of online data sources have APIs for their interfaces. And there's many R packages now to get at that, that, that get at those data sets. So one group is R open side, it's put up by the Sloan Foundation. And they have interfaces for you know Drive to talk about, Mendeley, uh, Entree, um, Flask, GBIF, a taxonomic name resolver. Taxonomists are always fighting about names. So you get two data sets that might not agree with names. This will allow you to go take the names, put them into somewhere, resolve them into the same set of taxonomy, bring them back to the merged species. So lots of resources there. You can reach about things up from literature packages, you can reach from FOSS, you can do that, you can get full kit information, you can do that. It's all free, open R stuff. So, that's something, so a, lot of, a lot of the packages I'll talk about today actually come from R open side. Another source of data, we got two different questions. Two questions. How does it perplex this wide world frame reference position? You want to do a little bit of analysis? So, if you look at the bottom of the here, I did an analysis of all the of all the, of all the faculty in my department, showed how technical they all were, uh, of these network two. We had like, you know, a plot of this, and people, people loved it. Look, that's my name! <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's great. <laughs> yeah. Or the or the plot of um, you know looking at five minutes with five minutes of time. Um, you can do phylogenies of languages. You can do phylogenies of text. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good question. Other questions? Okay. So <coughs> with GBIF, you have okay. This is Cox one. This is CO one. This is from Octodate. It's all the same gene, it's all the mitochondrial gene, but they have different annotations. And so, one way to get around that is this cloud service now, a little browser, and they get a full dump of GenBank and do n by n blast and align these genes. And say, okay, I don't care what the, what the names are, just show me what, what stuff aligns to each other. And <coughs> they also group it up, group it by taxonomic rank. And so, I can go in and look at all the, all the studies, of all, the, all the data that relates to turtles and elephants, and then group by G. Right? So it's like from octave one, CO one. And that has, um, this one has eight sequences in it, and the other people has 143 species. So it gives you ready made data sets for many species without having to do the, the, the alignment of grouping yourself, and that's one of the past annotations. Okay. And so you just once in the cloud on my friends and servers, and you can do a small cluster for this actually. You know, finishes one run, Google the GenBank, does it again, does it again, does it again. And so if you're working with the collaborator and you want to know what's the basic phylogeny for a group, you can get at this and pretty quickly go through and make a movement of your phylogeny. <coughs> so as you have your data, you can want to build a tree. I'll just build a tree, it's not a big deal, right? Well, um, <coughs> tree space is big. So here, this is a log scale, and this plot comes from our tree scale. And here's number of taxa. This one is growing, you know, doubling the number of taxa, it's this one. This is tenfold, it's a triple one. The number of possible trees is this one. It's going up double factorially, which means that <coughs> you know, for just you know, 50 trees, there are more possible tree topologies than are atoms in the universe. For just 50 taxa, so we have a tree of 50 taxa, right? So you know, a quarter of primates. If you have a quarter of primates, there are more possible trees than the atoms in the universe. Now we think there are at least a million species, right? <coughs> So, tree space is a very, very big, scary place. Okay. 
Um, and so you might think you need some you know, computational power to get at this. Okay. Um, <coughs> and actually, finding the optimal tree is often, depending on the algorithm, depending on the optimality criterion, an NP-complete problem. Okay. So here's an example of one. Another NP-complete problem. Uh, so I said to you, okay, I would have up to $15,500. Uh, I would say, okay, I want you know, 20 mixed fruit. Well, you can tell it doesn't work. So you can easily verify it's not a solution. How can you find a solution? Are there, are there any kind of solution yet? <laughs> There's actually at least two. I don't remember one. If I'm, if I'm, okay. If I said to you, okay, how about seven mixed fruits? Oh, it works. Right? So if you can verify a solution, they could do, it's very hard to have an algorithm to guarantee you give you that solution. You know, when you're in a successful amount of time. Okay? And lots of tree searches are like this. Where <coughs> there's no algorithm that's guaranteed to give you the right tree within a certain range of the So we have all these heuristic searches, similar kneeling, different search strategies, but all these different combinations are hard. Right? And there's not enough time in the age of the universe to actually look at any, every possible tree within some shortcuts. Okay. So getting a tree is scary. <coughs> so here's a simple tree. About you know, five years ago, and it was 13,000 species, okay. which took 32 gigs of RAM, which at the time you know, wasn't common. You know, that was right. <coughs> but that's just you know, 13,533 species, and that, imagine that search space is basically the size of the campus here. It's here, it's the credits, it's the right. It's like finding you know a rubber duck somewhere. On that's the search space for 13,533 species. And I add two species. Okay. How big does the search space, search space get? <laughs> the entire planet. Right. So the ratio of this area to this area, the ratio of the search area for a 13,533 taxon tree to 13,535 taxon tree. Okay. So again, this is a very big scary problem. So what can you do? <coughs> Reduce, reuse, recycle. Right. So once I built my tree of 13,000 plant species, you want to do a phylogeny of plants for some question, you know, how does wood evolve? You're going to just use my tree. And you evolved this years ago, and this is called tree base. It's a database of trees. And so what was hoped to happen is that we developed this culture of you must release your tree on tree base. These two are packages, um, tree base and then our drive is the, the diagnostic structure in this information that can get you those trees directly. Okay. <coughs> but now an NSF project is about a year and a half old um, that is creating a single unified tree and also the push of after all these trees as well. So this is coming soon. This all sounds great. However, the state of the art is this. I don't know what this picture is. Right, this is not a pipe. I thought I'd read. Okay? It's not a pipe, it's a picture of a pipe. And in the world of trees, 96% of trees are pictures of trees in literature. Only 4% are actually created in a reusable way. So you create a picture, picture of a tree, you get the JPEG, you slap it in your PDF, right? upload it. And then someone else has to, there's actually multiple tools that are called like tree thief and things like that that let you trace a tree and do OCR in the name and try to get the tree out that way. Right? Only 4% of people actually put their tree somewhere useful. Okay. So we have open science and we're failing here. Right? Um, <coughs> I'm careful. And people are to fight about it and they're working, but this is the state of the art. Okay. So you might be able to get a tree from someone publish as well. If not, you have to build your own. Okay. <coughs> and there are now cloud resources for that. So here's an older NSF project that's still running, the Cypress Science Gateway. And this is backed by Exceed, which we talked about yesterday. Right? So your taxpayer funded um, supercomputer. So you can get access to here, just some caveats, but it's in Korea, it's one of the other caveats like that. <laughs> right? 
um, <coughs> access, and then you can run a variety of tree inference software packages. Okay, you have things like checkpointing, point, and lots of resources. And <coughs> it's run a quarter million jobs so far. It's done hundreds of years. So it's been running for a long time, and it's very useful. So if you need to build a tree, you don't want to you know, hire it for a laptop. Any questions about this? Does anyone hear the question? I so. so, it was mentioned they use that fifty thousand tax on tree. I could either you know, delete taxa from that tree to get you know, seven species, or I can download the gem bank data for those seven species and build it up. Um, in part, it depends on how big that tree tree is. So, there are some large trees where, so, love, love, not just like a minute, we're in China, you want a amount of time between species and your Drawing the tree is going to use that time. Like it's like I'll fix this node and then I'll use some sort of null model of the branching and make up the branching time. Right? Um, <coughs> which we have all the data itself, we can do that. On the other hand, they might have multiple calibrations, they might have multiple fossil, fossil dates to say, you know, this node must be you know, at least this old, not older than this, and so forth. So as then you get a better estimate of the new node. And so we trade off that way. Yeah. In, in general, it's probably used to design a kind of big tree and use that. There's a super tree, which the trees stitch together from other trees. But, you know, are there other discussion about this? So, oh, tri trivial. I mean, there's a time of getting the data, looking at the data, trying to write. But the actual runtime on the laptop is pretty big. So even though it's an NP complete problem, what we spend a lot of time is getting the data to work really well. Um, it's not like a calculation that's very, very efficient length. So that's actually So we think that, I mean, so there's a few wrinkles. So we often think it's like one true tree, right? So like, you know, our square, so it shouldn't even know whether it's true close relatives or you know, close to us. Right? You know that it's a tree. But in some cases, we, there's hybridization of the that would be a single true tree. We don't see for that reason. So you know, can make the mitochondria, so it's a visual tree. Um, there's also other issues with um, if weights change over time, in certain ways. And so what we talk about is what's called breaking up one branch. If you a branch that has a long time without a piece of coming off of it, you can find pieces of branch at that point. You can help infer multiple changes better. And so it's possible then with a large tree to do better at that sort of relation. So there's these fights. There's also fights about um, statistical approach, right? Asian versus distance versus likelihood versus personal. And people fought and almost died over these things. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. So the space of trees I, I was talking about was the number of topologies, right? So a network graph, network relations that had that where branch lines don't matter. But what, what, what those things do that with the calibrations, it's all about getting the branch lines. So what people sometimes do is do a two-step process: first, the topology with initial branch lengths, and then stretch the tree such that it becomes a clock-like tree with some calibrations. You can also do it with joint. Other questions? Yep. 
um, again, by annoying some people and not other people, right? right? If you um, think you know, it's Yeah. Can I just add one other sure. thing? Which is, so Here, take, couple, it, take the mic. Oh, sorry. Just a couple of things to watch out for. Is this on? It's, it's going to the web. Right. Yeah. Uh, one's polytomies, so sometimes these super trees will have unresolved locations, and that can crash whatever your inference method is that you want to do. So you can uh, watch out for that. So just fine. So we think the way speciation happens is one species become two. In the simplest so you see, mountain range pops up. Okay, now this happens with one species, and that comes other species, right? And then after a while, they can't compete anymore. And so, for some of the phylogenetics, if we don't know what the resolution is, we we'll say, okay, we'll just call it as one becoming three. And it could be A and B becoming a clade, or B and C becoming a clade, or A and C. We don't know which it is. We just smash them together. Right? A lot of methods are hard coded to assume it's a bifurcating tree. And uh, another one was. Oftentimes, the mega trees will be sort of genus level or whatever, and they'll have these representatives. From, so they'll have the backbone tree, but they won't have the details of you know, all the most recent species. And so that's important you know, to get the stitching together or something like that, or those other methods. So and if you want to have uncertainty in trees, there's a whole set of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Imagine, I mean, it's given the search space and finite data, I mean, there's lots of uncertainty in these trees, and there's ways of incorporating that. Other questions? Okay. <coughs> now, calibrating a future time. What you can do here is you can talk to a paleontologist who knows something and mm -hmm. um, get ages for your groups. Because we often will look up something and say, okay, this, this fossil is from Cretaceous. Okay, and my coloring book here says Cretaceous goes from here to here <laughs> to far midpoint. And paleontologists know a lot more than that. But they also know that there's significant uncertainty, too. Like a paleontologist can say, okay, this goes here, and with this range. Right? Oftentimes, putting the fossil on the tree is hard. Right? I found it in the beetle, and this beetle go on the tree of insects. Is it within the clade of extant beetles? Is it such as extant beetles? Right? So it's issues like that. So dating a tree can be hard. Um, one thing you could possibly do, <coughs> but this should have been an animation, um, is this thing called pine tree. Which, which is, they've gone out and gotten, I think it's 2300 different calibrated trees. Okay. And put them all into one database. And so they can enter in, you know, dog and cat. And so they can plus all these trees, and then the dog and cat will merge. Okay. So you get all this information from other studies, but presumably well done. There's, no okay. There's a risk of doing this sort of game of telephone where you use, you use their dates and then you put your database, your trees in the database, and then you use yours, but it's better than nothing. Um, one problem with this, though, and this should be public later, is that <coughs> in terms of cloud resource, look, don't touch. Um, you can't write an automated, you're not allowed to write an automated script to, to hold that data down. You could, it's very feasible, it's very good, but you're not allowed to. Apparently, they want to write right. um, No, get down to one database. It's one of the things where it's good for if you want to say to your niece, you know, oh, how close are you going to drop? Let's see, you drop. Years. It's good for that, but for calibration, it can be difficult if you want to scale it. It's, that's what the iPhone app is for. You can see it. Oh, yeah, they have, they have, they have an iPhone yeah. app, an iPad app, so a, a poster. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's another one, the more open one, called Date Life, that's just starting out. And there they allow you to, they allow you to um, so called the you know, to mm -hmm. scrape everything. Big problem here is there's very few trees. This has like maybe 30 trees or so, compared to 2,700 trees. All right, so there's a trade-off between great coverage but closed and awful coverage but open. Right? And you can try and you can you by adding trees to here. Okay. And there's also is the calibration too. Okay. And calibration matters because a lot of questions are about great resolution. Right? We want to care about do birds speciate or go speciate faster or go extinct slower than populations. But part of it matters like how long, how old are the two groups? So I'll go to time. So looking at trees. Alright. So we're talking about Gigi plot two today, or so we'll just look at a tree. Right? Actually it's very hard to even do that in this domain. Okay. So <coughs> here we have our tree. There's thirteen thousand three names. 
strings of text. Okay. Your fancy HDTV. How many bits of text do you fit per pixel? I could put, you know, 10 words per pixel on, the, on your HDTV. Um, <coughs> people tiling the computer monitors. Okay. So you have the tiles computer monitor, the tiles together. Okay. Again, it doesn't scale just terribly well. Right? And actually, this is one of the, it's still kind of state of the art. High resolution, really extendable, cheap. Okay. <laughs> so here's one of the postdocs at Nimbus when he was a grad student. And he hand built this tree from Colgate and then put the wall and he like, check it out. Okay. So it's important because you know we usually recently published a paper that had a tree of 50,000 species on it. Right? And <coughs> we know that from many, many data sets that one group called Amborella, one, one species is sister to all other angiosperm species. That is, instruments evolved, the species event, one went and became Amber up, one became everything else. Right? There's lots of evidence for this. <coughs> and on our tree, if you look at it carefully, up Amber is not actually sister to everything else. Okay. So if we could have done a you know, we could have done a constraint analysis of the note must be that way, but it's forced to be that way. Because the other made doesn't matter for our analyses. Okay, but even when you know that means you can look at the tree. Okay. <coughs> and this becomes a Big deal. And <coughs> there are various ways to, to deal with this. Here's one of them that came out recently. I'm not on this at all. It's called Lunzoom. And so it works the way Google Maps do. If you're familiar with Google Maps, you zoom in and it loads more and more detailed tiles and you mm -hmm. zoom back out. You can do the same thing as well. You can zoom in, you have to build more data, everything, and then zoom back out. And a lot of, there are a lot of now tree viewers like this that sort of Dynamically scale and compress, which can be good for some things. But here we say, okay, you know, if monitoring your bad fit or my people, you pick that up. Oh, you zoom and say, okay, is trying to fit where it really should be, and get that information. Any questions about this? Yeah. What does the tree actually look like? Oh, the data look like. Yeah. So there's of course multiple data formats. Um, the most basic is Newick, which is named after Newick Seafood Restaurant in New Hampshire. Because, <laughs> uh, there was a evolution meeting there, and a bunch of the, like you know the five people who were building phylogenetic software said, "Let's go out and decide on this standard." So they went and decide on the Newick standard, and the Newick standard. It's just a series of so a tree. So a tree like this, um, bonobo, chimp, human, gorilla. One way of looking at it is like a series of nesting, right? These are people looking at it from above. And I have bonobo, chimp, and then bonobo, chimp, human, and then bonobo, chimp, human, gorilla. Right? And all the standard is, Okay. So it's very simple and it's, it's very efficient. Um, <coughs> this is a problem with it though. So is this tree the same as this tree? Like switch these? Yes, it is. You look at it, no. So we do some sort of string matching to take that into account. Okay. Um, and this you have to add metadata. So if you want to say, you know, how long is this branch? Okay, let's say this is 14 million years. Can add colon colon fourteen. That's really the basic tree structure. Um, if in code, you often do you know parent child sibling relationship, or if you do a matrix, it shows parent offspring relationship in the tree. It shows you know this node has two descendants, this node has two descendants. Other questions about this? We've found our other standards too. There's a um, XML version, there's a JSON version. Um, other questions? Okay. <coughs> All right, so now we 
have our tree. Look at our tree, it looks okay. And only as we answer our questions to get, get cool data. Okay. And it's a wonderful time now because oh, often you have to go out and you know, want to figure out where plants are, you have to go out and like, look at each plant, or go to the berry, look at the sheep, and say, okay, you are in, you know, you know, Knox County, Tennessee, is that the map? Right? But now we have we're digitizing all this information. Okay. So for example, GBIF, okay. 240 million occurrences, 1.4 million species. And our open science folks have made an interface to pull that data down. Okay. So you, you know, pull the data down from the cloud, you have to clean it up, right? Some people say, we'll put down as a record where it's where the average specimen is, that's where we found it. So we found it, we put it in Harvard's herbarium, so it's now in Harvard's herbarium. So it was found in China, it was literally in China. So it was filtered that sort of thing. Um, and you get the same thing with GenBank, and all these data set, all these big databases have things to clean up. Right? Once you do that, great research. Um, <coughs> dryad. Just put something in Dryad. Okay, good. At some point, all of you will. Right. Well, because journals are requiring it. Right. So why did tree base fail? Why don't we move to public trees? Well, wouldn't that be swell, guys? If we put our trees together. Like, yeah, it's swell, but I'm busy. Right. With Dryad, if you have the systematic biology, you will put things on Dryad, okay, or you will not get published. Okay. And so it's sort of a, a stick model. There's carrots too. If you, if you publish your data, you get more citations, you know, your work's more useful to people, you're a better scientist, right? but also, otherwise you don't get published. Okay? <coughs> and so there's our interfaces to all this data. Like, you just multiply it here, 70,000 downloads. Just data alone. So it's, it's good to be clear. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm not sure, I'm not sure what the R open side of intervention is, whether it's like Excel versus capital images test or just merge it properly. I don't think it's like yeah. Um Are you, are you open with Okay. I'm sort of now too, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it says like core of like four young eager scientists and then just keep like wandering on and let's, let's all work together. It's great. Yeah. Is there another question back? All right. Um, those are the PLUDB. Right. Do you want to find it's funny? Because that's where they were in the Cretaceous. Right. <coughs> and this has fossil reference. Where did T. Rex occur? Okay. And this is a few of the available data sets out there. There's tons of data about. Um, uh, this is Blue Paleo DB. And then I show so you can plot on, they have all the records, and you can plot the records on a map of the Cretaceous. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. And there's a there's a schism with the PaleoDB where the person who developed it. There was a fork, and there's competing groups now. Yeah. It's messy, and people fight over data. Data is hard to get, but for us, the data is easy to get. Now. You can go and just download it using our little R scripts. You make sure you 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 decrypt those who you know went out in the field and chopped down the tree and measured its diameter. Well, you can get by mosquitoes, but you know for us, we can get some huge data sets now. And the data sets about, um, from, you know, from information about where plants live, we figure out, you know, that information about their uh, elevation or rainfall they're exposed to, other animals in the environment. So there's lots and lots of data. There's data about genome size, plant seed size, um, litter size in mammals. So all these data sets are available. There's more and more of a trend of, of publishing them to, to, to online, and we can incorporate them into our workflows in our. Any questions about data sources? And finally, we can now answer our question finally. 
All right, so we have our tree, we have our cool data. Now you can put them together into a cool method and answer a question. You know, what did one of the frogs sound like? The dinosaurs have small genomes. And so in R, you actually get task view. Who's, who's seen a task view before? About half of you. Okay, so task view is a curated set of packages in R. That can be you know, all the packages that deal with high performance computing. I about that yesterday. So it's when I say, okay, I want to put things on a cluster or something. What do I do? It's out there. And so you can try Googling CRAN, R, H, P, C. It won't work. But if you go to a task view, you can see what someone in the field has, has organized as these are the methods for the description about them. You want to install them all at once, all the packages you can. Um, library CTV, install packages, it's, it's install views, high performance computing, or phylogenetics. So here's one for phylogenetics that has the description of approaches, looking at potential states, looking at divergence times, and so forth. And then here you see some of the packages in R to deal with that. I think bring them to workflows. And right now, for that part, if you want, want to do it on the cloud, it's, it's mostly up to you, not entirely. So there's iPlant, for example. <coughs> this is for enabling plant science. They don't check if you have plants. You could do mammals. And go, okay, sure, mammals, whatever. Okay? And you can load your data and they can do, it's like the cycle of discovery. It's like the cycle of science data in some ways. Okay, you upload your data, you can run analyses. IPlant has more of the comparative methods things. So you have used Geiger in the past, Geiger's up there. <coughs> if you have some tool that you want to use, there's actually a way for the community to, to add things to that resource. Okay, so you can add things and then it will run on everyone's computing servers in, I think it's Texas now, um, and get your analysis back. Okay, so, and again, it's free. Except for taxpayers. Yeah. Actually, some of the back end of the iPlant is actually done in R. Okay. Um, this is now actually an R interface to iPlant, too. So if you want to get it at it in R, you can see the log interface and you can do that. So you can add it to your regular workflow. Okay. Um, and another NSF funded thing that's about a year and a half old is this Arbor thing, which I get involved in, but it's promising. We'll have workflows we put together and we'll run on some software. As the Carmen colleagues. Okay, and that should be out in the next year or so. I guess those are some of the existing packages for the questions in R. Um, one of it, though, it still makes sense that you do it on your own hardware or put it on Amazon or something like that and use those packages. Um, <coughs> well, also, one caveat about the pair of methods packages. So we talked about how you know, the tree inference, we're good at minimizing, at minimizing speed and maximizing speed at doing like big calculations efficiently, not having too much memory. Okay. So the pair of method stuff, like figure out the essential state, that's written by biologists like me, right? Who often are just sort of trying to get their method into a package and get it out and publish it. Okay. It's not well optimized. You know, it hasn't been our box at all. Okay. <coughs> but it hasn't been tested at all. It might even work properly. So um, for a while, like so one of the big packages is Geiger, which is great and useful, right? This example file for one of its analyses, you actually get the wrong, you would actually get an estimate of a value that is not the MLE. Okay? Because they have these fixed hard limits, you would expose change limit, you get to find the MLE. The MLE is like 22. You wouldn't get there because it's hard coded 20. Um, <coughs> another program called rate called eight, eight would give you negative rate estimates. It's really going from A to C, negative five. Um, is something now that's been fixed, but you get, get that sort of thing a lot in these packages. And so something that's worth considering, you know, it, it should be an easy search, but oftentimes it doesn't work well. So you, you, as a user, be careful and cautious. Yeah? Uh, can you talk about So for the tree formats, there's been, but there's been some stuff. But the data in general, yeah. 
Not that I know of. Anyone else know of any potential, potential standardized formats? The great thing about standards is everybody has one. <laughs> yeah. There's some good conversion code. That's crucial to know about. So let's go read some things and sequences. Yeah. Yeah, so there's actually a task view that lists all the interfaces from R to all these resources. So it's not just the R open side people, but just anyone in general. So you look at that. Um, a more general database, I'm not sure <coughs> if anything like that. Oh, yes, no, but there's a task view for, um, I think, R with scraping, scraping HTML or with what? Yes, yeah, web technologies, right? So it's just our interface into other resources on the web. Yeah, so that's available. I'll add that link to the set. Yep, so that, that first slide that had the Brand American Info tutorials, uh, Philo Cloud, has all these links. It has links to everything. And it's on Twitter, and I'll also put it on the WordPress site, so you'll get it up. Okay, so. Do my few learning objectives. Right? So, project is awesome. Show up right now. Look for files with tree size and also with bad programming at times. Um, many, many resources available. Okay? And do use them. Okay. The cloud's out there. Taxpayers are paying for it. Use it until you need to do something else. And you right. Any general questions about this? Anyone have use cases they want to talk about? You want to Paper back in the 80s, yeah, yeah. Um, showing that some of the like here here also could be misled by the three way thing of code being very important. You have a tree like Mistakenly, you can drop it as due to similar changes happening by chance. And so, maybe joining has an issue. How can you do that? That's a good, if you have a correct model.
So a lot of a lot of the like utility project is a big tree. A lot of big trees you see are made with this type of It's not really hard to install. But fiber first pass is not bad, so if that's what you're doing that kind of thing talking about, it's maybe that kind of thing. But with more potential, like this one needs to be still in the house. So I was surprised me actually when people go out of the field and like, I had studied these 20 plants to death and I love them and I didn't even want to bother them. Did you get a treat for them or not? But they just get to be out in some different systems. And it's not hard to do it with the same. You don't have to look at them. Other questions? Yeah, um, <laughs> well, it's not no, um, <coughs> so for data cleaning, there is some stuff is a taxonomic connection, right? Stuff that has a lot of And then, I learned that Google has some of this, what it's called, but Google has a lot of data, and this is like, yeah, you know, you know, you know, a lot of people that do it. People have workflows, so like for GBIC data, people do a lot, have things to go through and say, okay, I got to bear it. Um, are you in the middle of the ocean or in the past? And so there's things like that. Um, that's a general tool. Yeah. Anyone else got any sort of data team? Yeah. That's the lot. Yeah, a lot of things when you get at this scale, maybe some weird thing. It's not even to look at your data at the time. Oh, wait, that happens in the ocean. So if you just ran through and you don't actually map it, you might not say, oh, no, wait, they switched the sign in the longitude. Yeah, and then maybe the most infuriating thing about the databases is that often they're very difficult to fix it. Right? Because it should be one person sees that and fixes it and it's done. Right? Yeah. 
but, or at least flagged it so the people in public are using problematic records. But so God knows what you're using. It seems impossible to do that. Like, it's even agenda. Yep. It's, it's up to the original authors to fix things. And, and uh, I don't know. If you could wave a magic wand, it would be a better way of doing that stuff. Right. So you, you really got to be careful. You can, almost everything has some level of error. So you have to have the data, gene data, names, especially, you know, identifying orthologs and parallels. And you can, if you get a result that seems really Amazingly different than what's previously published. You can really triple check it because you could have just used it. What's the same? It could be both. Did you say there was a test for the Yes, there is cat size. Works that's valid for having a one gene. So, if you switch camp to fallen, you have eight gen on which is not or one. If you're looking at records of you know, host of this vector on, that really is the same thing, right? But these new involvers can figure that out. Yeah, so that's the question. Yeah. One of the reasons we have to use that logic is to control for non dependence. This is a boring reason. Right? But if you're looking at you know, how many times these things are scored and have hair, well, it hasn't been maintained at all multiple times. <coughs> and technical logic that was rose, and then once they became in, we have hair. That's you know, two changes. And so you count them as 4,000 changes. So I was going to test with that too. It's not sexy, but you have to do it. This might be a higher uh, uh, but are you familiar with the uh, terms that are going on in the phylogenetic ecology and community ecology? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Is it trees or not? Yeah. It's just uh, like referring mm -hmm. things like community assembly and community Yeah, I think it's important to look at the history of phylogenetic and community that means like history. I think some of the bigger measures like are these are the dispersed or dispersed? I always, I'm always concerned with, because there are so many different methods you can use to interpret the problem in the first place, um, the interpreter is not known or how many of the interpreter is kind of in this kind of way. Yeah, so way back when we were first doing trees for a competitive method, we would tell you that like, if you don't know a tree, you know how much of it you need to analyze and you know, how it might be compared to the trees. So it seems like, again, contrast, we have two, just two times. It's fairly robust to three errors, um, and so you can probably use any type of your way. Other things are based more on weight resolution. It doesn't have names yet, but then it could be tested by it. So you look at things like um, initiation processes, right? and then you get into the family of the initiation model. And if you find a state initiation model, again, yeah, yeah, maybe it could be that way too, but it's maybe it's also a pretty good um, Stuff like that. In the general ecology, you can also do like, you know, you do a test and get like, it's going to be better because it involves that idea of the tree, the transformation of the tree. What I'm doing is not for a single item of the tree, but all I'm using is tree to choose the tree to tell
Thank you all.